Hello everyone and welcome back to the NPC Dungeon. Today's DM Advice episode is a very special one in that it came at the request of one of my oldest and most active viewers, so thank you for that. It's also part of a topic that I've been meaning to cover for a while, but just haven't gotten around to it yet, so thanks for keeping me on track as well. I also had more to say than I thought, so it'll be in two parts. That said, today's and tomorrow's, I guess, episodes, you can probably tell from the title, are all about world building. More specifically, they're going to be all about how the world you might have constructed can alter and hopefully change the story that you're trying to tell, and hopefully enhance the story that you're trying to tell. I want to start out by making the point that world building Building on its own isn't necessarily good or bad, it's just like anything else. It's all about how you use it, and it's all about how you go about it. I'm going to talk a little bit about how I go about it, and go over a few, literally a few. I have three super important pointers that I find useful when I'm planning. I'll go over the first two today, and tomorrow's episode, the part two to this episode, is going to have one that I'm going to go really in depth with, and I'm going to go over an example that the same viewer actually recommended. And as usual, everything that I'm going to say will be more geared toward the topic of a tabletop role-playing game like D&D, and you might use these principle and running a game like that. But that's enough for an introduction, so let's get on to today's topic, and as always, let's learn something. So world building. It's fun, right? Chances are, if you're here, you really enjoy it. And chances are, if you clicked on this episode in particular, you're either building a world for a game you intend to run, or you want to build a world for a game that you're thinking about running. But if this is your first step, I recommend backing up a little bit. If you're running a game of D&D or something, or even if you're a writer like myself, and you're writing either a sci-fi or a fantasy story of some kind, remember that what you're trying to do is tell a story. You're trying to lead people through a story. The story should be first. The story should be prior. I recommend having a good concept of it in your head first before you begin building up your world. That way you know what you're building horror, and that way you know the purpose of everything and the purpose that everything serves in the world for the story. And a tabletop role-playing game like D&D, as I know I've said before on this channel, tends to meander. If your world building isn't very focused like that, all you're going to end up doing is adding on to that and contributing to whatever confusion your players might feel when the story does begin to meander. And plan for that. Plan for that meandering. But I want to be clear though, when I say put the story first, I am not saying that you should be planning for the story to be going in a certain single direction because it almost never will. What I'm saying is just what I said earlier. Start with a simple, solid concept in your head and go from there. Know the kinds of things that are going on in the world in order for the different elements of the story to take place. See, the story is still prior there, and then keep in mind the kinds of general directions that you want things to go in. But all this is still kind of up in the air and possibly a little bit confusing, so let's go in with an example. So let's say that you have a concept involving the politics centering around the nobility of some given city that you made. Maybe one house is becoming especially powerful and it's your player's job to figure it out. Well, that's your story. That is the concept. That's what's going on. Now what's going on in the world. This is also part of the story. Maybe they're simply funneling money through a network of bribes and threats and using local muscle to shake down local businesses or something like that. Now, what might your players do to figure this out? Well, they might try to infiltrate some events where a lot of wealthy nobles would be gathered. They might try to visit local businesses who end up getting targeted. They might learn about local criminal groups and who they're tied to. They might look into a local merchant's bank or something. And they may even want to check in with other noble houses and see what's up with them. Now you have a lot of direction to build in. You see, if you just started building, you'd be making things haphazardly and you wouldn't know if they'd be directly connected to the story. Now you know that everything you build will be connected to the story in some way. Let's go with the example a little bit further. Make the criminal syndicate, figure out what they are and how they started, what they're involved in, why they're involved, where they are, what they do, why they do that. Maybe this city is known for certain exports, and they specialize in retrieving and smuggling said products. And that's just a few examples of what you can do with this. And the same thing goes for everything else that I just mentioned in the world. I'm not going to go through all of it because obviously we'd be here all day if I did, but I encourage you to take that prompt that I just made and kind of build from there and see how having the story concept first can really help you know what you're going to build in your world and possibly reduce confusion later on down the line you start running the game. You'll probably find, as I said a second ago, that this method is a lot easier and it gives you much more focus than just kind of building. I want to emphasize this. There's no trade-off here at all. It's not that it's easier but less focused. It's much easier and you can build and be more focused. As I said, you don't have to sacrifice ease for amount or amount for focus or anything like that that you might typically expect. And yes, obviously you'll be building a lot, but you'll be doing a lot anyway. As I said, this is D&D after all and it ain't easy. And now once you start doing that, now you have my permission to world build. Otherwise, you run the risk of falling into an item call the world building black hole, where you make a bunch of different things that don't really contribute to the game and have no real direction or meaning. If you just build first before making the story and try to kind of fit the story and inject the story into it, you may feel like you have a lot to work with, you may feel like you have a lot of pieces and things developed for your world, but when you sit down to play, I can almost guarantee you that it will feel like a barren wasteland. You don't know that anything you have will actually contribute to the story. And even if you do build a lot, you have this really intricate world, you can have the most finely constructed world ever, but if your players have no story and nowhere to go, you do not create a campaign in which you did 
is you wrote a history book. History is cool and all, don't get me wrong, but when I sit down to play D&D, my goal is not to be passively led along by the hand through a world, rather I want to experience and drive a story forward. And besides, if you at least start the story first, I understand you can't get it completely built first, then you'll find the act of world building just sort of comes from that. I know I said earlier that I wasn't going to go back to any more of those points that I mentioned in my example before, but I'm going to revisit it. Say you need your players to go to some kind of merchant bank, like I said before, or your players intend to go to some kind of merchant bank, and maybe it's because they suspect some kind of shady dealings are going on there. Well, because you have planned for that part of the story, and because you have planned ahead for it and you know that's part of the story, you now know that you're going to need to build a bank. Now ask yourself, is there a noble family that runs it? Who are they? Where are they from? What kinds of dealings do they have? Where is the bank? Why is it there? What kind of connections does it have? How does magic affect how valuables are stored and transported in your world in this bank? This is what I meant earlier when I said the story gives you direction. You can think about these questions all day long, and you can build in directions from your world, but if you have the story first, you know which directions are most beneficial for you to build in. See what I mean specifically when I say that giving the story narrative first helps give your world building direction? You see, the world building that you do in your story enhances it in that it bolsters the story. Like I said earlier, you can have a rich and vibrant world rife with detail, but if those details are not related to your actual story itself, it's just going to feel empty, no matter how much you have in it. But more about detail on the next point. I say the same thing about world building for D&D, and really just world building in general, that I do about writing and building a scene when you're writing. It's not necessarily about the amount of detail that you give, it's more about the specific details and the specific kinds of details that you present. At the risk of going a little bit off topic, I'll give an example about writing, and then kind of work my way back over to DMing. I promise it's related, just bear with me. Let's say you're writing a scene about a building burning down, and maybe your protagonist is trying to escape. Obviously, you might want to be a little descriptive. You might want to describe the choking smoke, the burning eyes, the intense heat, and not just because they present a very powerful descriptive image, which they might in my humble opinion, but you might want to pick those specifically because they also characterize the protagonist's struggle and help with the reader in the mindset. Now if you're just describing the protagonist watching the building burn from a safe distance, you probably use different details, obviously depending on the character's intent and reason for being there. And it's the same thing with D&D. I'll talk about describing a scene in D&D to your players, how that relates to world building, and then I'll make my way to the act and process of world building itself. So you're describing a scene, try to keep those same things in mind that I mentioned just a second ago in terms of writing. Obviously think about what your players are doing here who their characters are and what they might latch on to, think about their passive perception if you're playing D&D 5e, and use that to paint a broad image as you describe the scene to them. But just like I said earlier in regards to planning an encounter or location, or what have you, to a story, and tailoring it to the story, now is your chance to pull from those details and pick and choose what you show to your players. I mentioned earlier in my example that your players might go to a noble house. I swear I feel like I'm going to actually end up going over all these particular details in this episode, even though I said I wasn't going to. But anyway, they go to a noble house. Remember when I said to start asking yourself questions? While planning, you might have asked yourself, for example, where they came from, and when describing, you might realize they might have decorations from the part of the world they hailed from set around their place of residence. You can world build that. What kind of business are they in? Depending on the day of the week, they may have clients over. They may have records or specific rooms set aside for whatever they do. And speaking of what they do, what do they do for fun? Do they have an art studio somewhere, maybe a small music hall or a chamber? Do they have a massive dining hall for entertaining guests? All this and more can help you get across who they are. The really cool thing about this method that I like to employ is that you don't ever even have to directly say anything. You have this indirect method of characterizing them, so to speak. You don't have to tell your players this family is really into music. They can see it. It's kind of like that age-old writing advice show, don't tell. Now you kind of see why I started with a point about descriptive writing. And as promised, I'm going to finish off with how this helps with actual world building. After all, I do give D&D and DM and GM advice on this channel, so let's go into a little bit of that. Well, as I already hinted to a little bit just a moment ago, details aren't only transmitted through description when playing D&D. NPCs might tell your players about things. There might be some other things they just see in the world. For example, I ran a game recently that started in a very tall city. My players could see constant construction of keep work going on. The city was this way because an event that happened many years ago that rendered much of the outside world too hostile for the average person, so instead of building out, they had to build up. That first part was gotten out with description, and my players were informed of all the historical details, either by knowledgeable NPCs, if it ever became relevant, by reading if they wanted to, and just by members of the party who had lived there for a while and just knew. But I try not to force this information on them, and I didn't just describe it to them. They only learned it if they either wanted to or if it became relevant. But as I said there would be, there were a few details they would just see. One of which being the fact that traveling to different layers of the city was done with the different giant mechanical elevators. And that's just all presentation. It's not description, it's not dialogue, it's just presentation. When it comes to actually building the details to be presented in the world however, you might want to think about what's going on in the story and what details and things you might want to build that might be relevant for that. And just like with the elevators, if you're building the criminal syndicate like I had mentioned earlier, you might want to know who leads 
it. And if you do, you might want to start building what kinds of ranks and rituals they have. And just like when the elevators come into play to show how big the city is and how you travel throughout the city, so can those ranks be used to characterize this criminal syndicate if the players, for example, ever try to infiltrate it. And as a bonus note, in that case, you'll be ready if that ever happens. And that's really key too. Building like this helps you be ready if your players do things you don't expect. If I just started randomly building this criminal syndicate all willy-nilly, so to speak, I might have never come across that and running that kind of infiltration arc would have been a lot more difficult. And once you begin building your world in this way, you'll find that it can actually help reciprocate return the favor and help you start building future branching story paths as well. Going back to the criminal syndicate, you might say that you want to figure out what's the leader's motivations, what's their title, what kind of things do they do, and how do they get in touch with the noble house in the first place. Maybe they're blackmailed or manipulated, maybe they're the ones with the real control, and then like I said, you can start building from the story from there. And lastly, those little details might not just be useful for you, they might also be useful to your players. Earlier, when I said the noble house might have a music hall or a dining hall or something like that, you're not just building extra details, you're giving your players certain ways in certain things they can use. If they have a dining hall and they're famous for throwing huge parties, the players might be able to find a way to get invited to one of them and build up in that way. If they're really into music, the players can use that as a conversation point, especially if they have a bard. If they have clients or records rooms set aside for the craft, the players may learn about their work and may find a way to quietly possibly be able to investigate from there. There really is a lot that you can do with this. You never know what's going to happen. But what about the overall story at large? A lot of what I've talked about thus far is really geared more toward plot and encounters, and as broad as those can get, I haven't talked about the actual feel of the campaigns. What you might call on writing the mood or the tone, but don't worry, that's actually next, and like I said, that'll be tomorrow's episode. So feel free to come back then for the part two of this special two-part world building series, and feel free to check out my other episode this week, which is about another character that I more recently played, more specifically it's about the backstory of a character that I more recently played, and feel free to come back next week where I'll talk a little bit more about world building and finish off the finale of the Brynwyn story for now. I really hope this is helpful, thank you for watching, and until next time, let's learn something. Thank you.